Hello. Welcome to our webinar. Uh, we're just, uh, yes, I'm seeing some attendees arrive, so we'll just give people a few minutes to uh, to log on and uh, get us up and loaded, and we'll kick off shortly. So just sit back, relax, grab a cup of coffee, and we'll be with you uh, just after four o'clock. All right, hello everyone. I hope you can all hear us. 
So um, today's webinar is on knowing your numbers. So it's all about understanding the financial reports and everything. So I'm going to be your moderator today. I'm Shana. So I'll be uh, managing all your questions that you might have. And um, I'll just oversee the running of the general webinar. Hopefully it all works well. Um, so I work here at um, Group of Health Chartered Accountant as well. So hopefully by now you guys are all know how to use Zoom, but um, if you haven't used Zoom before, uh, down the bottom you can see the settings. So on the far left you can see the audio settings if you wanted to test your speakers. Um, and if you had any questions throughout the webinar, you can click on that Q&A button and just leave your questions and we can answer them at the end or, um, or I can see if you're having trouble with any of the webinars. Um, if you want to leave me, of course, you can push the, um, the leave meeting button at the bottom as well. So I'd like to introduce uh, Greg Verhoef, <laughs> who is the principal here at Greg Verhoef Chartered Accountant, and he will be presenting our webinar for us today. So thank you, Greg. Lovely. Um, thanks for that, Shana. Um, and thanks for everyone um, on our uh, attendees today who's joining us to listen into our webinar. It's um, great to see you guys um, tuning in. Hopefully you learned something from today's uh, discussion um, and at the end there'll be the, a link so you can watch it again or share it with other people uh, who might find this interesting down the track. So we're a, um, a small um, chartered accounting practice. Uh, there's a wee team of about five of us here and we have an office on Anderson's Bay Road. Um, and we work with a lot of um, you know, small, medium sized enterprises and businesses, um, helping people to understand what's going on in their business, um, helping them to look at strategies to grow their business and, and put plans in place to uh, you know, achieve the goals they want to get to. Um, uh, just thought I'd like to share the uh, thought of today's session. Um, a budget is not just a collection of numbers, but an expression of our values and aspirations. Um, Hopefully uh, you guys do have some budgets in place um, of where you're wanting to go for this year and what you're inspiring your business to achieve over the, the remaining part of this financial year. So this, this webinar is about um, demystifying uh, what the numbers mean um, and understanding some of the most common reports that you typically see um, in, in sort of accounting terms. Quick flip through the agenda. Um, probably take us 40 to 45 minutes to get through this, so there'll be some time for questions at the end. So please don't feel afraid just to, to log your questions as you go. Um, we're going to have a bit of a look at uh, you know, what the numbers mean, an overview of the different types of reports, uh, talk a bit about the difference between a profit and a cash report, uh, business value, what drives business value, quick look at what you can do to protect your assets. I mean, that's another whole uh, field that we could do a whole webinar just on its own. Um, best practice as far as reporting um, and what you can do about if you want to engage us to do some more work for you or what we can help you with. All right. So, um, why do you need to know your numbers? Well, the, the numbers tell you a story about what's going in your, on in your business. Um, and there really isn't, much in the way of hidden meanings, the numbers just represent volumes or quantities of, of what's happening in your business. They provide us with some insights on the changes that's going on, and they provide us a, a, a method of you know, comparing our um, performance against benchmarks. So it might be that we're comparing against a budget, we might be comparing against last year's results, we might be repairing against um, uh, uh, the last year to date figures, um, or we might be looking at what our total um, volume of something is at the moment. Being on top of your numbers it means that you, uh, you, know, you understand what's going on in your business, and that can help identify if there are some problems um, um, going on in your business. Um, you know, things like uh, low GP margins might indicate that you're not pricing things correctly, or there's a lot of wastage going on, um, things like that. Um, early warning signs, if things are going poorly, the numbers will point that out and, and hopefully give you some time to do something about that before it becomes dire. Um, the areas of the business that are going well, what's strong, what's not, uh, and you know, basically just having good information about your business allows you to make good decisions um, you know, in, in order to, to 
you know, make good decisions. You need to know what's going on. All right, next slide. So an overview of the quick of the key reports that we're looking at today. So a trading account uh, is you know, um, specific to a particular part of the business. Profit and loss report, uh, which is you know, for a period of time, we're looking at the, the trading over a period of time. Balance sheet is what our assets and liabilities are at a set point in time, the difference to over a period is actually at a particular day. Changes in equity, quick look at that. Um, depreciation is, is one of those magical things that us accounts love to dream up, but I'll, I'll explain a bit more about that. And the current accounts, shareholder current accounts are just one of those areas that, that seem to catch a lot of people out. They don't know what they mean. Um, so we'll have a quick, a quick look at those as well. Right, trading account. So um, this is you know, almost something like most people are probably familiar with a profit and loss. So a trading account is just effectively a profit and loss, but normally for a specific area of the business. And it's um, everything above the sort of the gross profit line. So it looks at your, um, you know, your, your sales, your direct costs, um, whether that's stock and materials, and then the other direct costs which are you know, going to delivering those sales. So it includes most things, but not the overheads. All right, so it's sort of the, the, the gross profit of um, the trading. And you could have it for particular regions. So you might have different uh, trading accounts for different regions if you operate in different towns or different parts of the country, or it might be for different parts of your business. So you might have one that covers your um, vehicle operation you know if you're in a trucking business it might cover the trucking and the other side might be you might have a bit of the business that does some forestry so you have a separate trading account for the forestry from the trucking just for example so we've got an example here um, we're just going to work through so this is a trading account for foods company um, and i'll just sort of click through we'll talk about the different things so right at the top here is the date um, and this would normally be headed up, you know, trading account uh, for the period uh, from 1st of April to the 30th of September. So it's important to understand what period you're actually looking at um, and, you know, whether it's six months or a year or one month. Um, so that normally that's normally at the top, but it's not they put in this case. So in this case, we've got sales just over a million dollars. Um, that's our total revenue. And then the next one down is our cost of sales. So the cost of sales is a combination of the stock that's been purchased, um, plus the opening stock and less the closing stock. So the way, to th the way I tend to think of this is that we've sold all our stock on hand, we've brought some more stock, and we've still got some stock left. So we take that back off to give us the, the cost of the stock that has been sold to generate that $1 million of turnover. So um, after taking off that cost, we end up with a, uh, a gross profit of uh, just on 700,000. Um, and then we've got some direct costs. These are not our, not our um, product costs or materials. These are just uh, you know, delivery costs, uh, direct wages. You can see them listed out there. Um, so they come off next and that's giving us a gross surplus in this case of 248,000, uh, which is 24%. So if every dollar we sell, every dollar item we sell, uh, we're getting 24%, 24 cents come through into our uh, profit and loss. And out of that, of course, we've got to take our, our overheads. All right, so um, now, if we were um, you know, sort of looking at this and thinking, oh, what could we change, what we, could we improve? Um, we could increase our, um, increase our sales by say 10%. And we might do that through some additional marketing. We might do that through some price changes. Um, we could have a, uh, a reduction in cost of sales by having less waste, um, by having improving our margin, um, better ordering. And if we can sort of look through, if we say if we cut our direct costs by 5%, we could then end up with some you know, different figures. So in this case here, we've sort of worked that through and if we had an increase in sales of 10%, that gives now 1.1 million of turnover. Cost of sales comes down by 5%, gives us 300,000 of cost of sales, and our overheads down by 5%. Um, means that we've got our costs have come down and our gross surplus then goes up. 
and uh, our gross surplus has increased in this case by 140,000, uh, which now brings us to about 35% GP. Okay, so understanding the numbers just means that we can we can look at how we can change things and the effects that they might might have. Um, and of course, we could we could make those changes and then run the actual numbers and find, of course, that we don't end up with those results. Uh, if we increase our prices too much, we might lose our customers and then our sales might die, in which case you then might revert back to your old pricing. But you know, having an understanding of what those numbers do, how they affect your gross profit uh, and how they affect your sales is really important. Okay, um, so profit loss. Um, so yeah, it's profit loss. So it's our trading. So we talked about trading as far as a section of the business um, up to that gross profit line. Uh, the gross profit is before overheads. So our profit and loss statement brings everything in together. So we now have our, our sales, our cost of sales, and all the overheads coming into that. It's for a particular period. Um, and also remember, it's not the same as cash, okay? Uh, we are aligning our income and our costs so that all of the costs in order to generate that particular income is in our profit and loss statement. So that includes the, the stock that we've purchased that we haven't paid for, includes our overheads that we've, we've used that haven't paid for, things like PAYE where we pay it a month later, um, or anything else that hasn't actually been paid for at that time, we tend to pull those things back in either through our accounts payable or some uh, accrual journals. Um, so the idea is, to, you know, we're working out the profit for that period. Um, so this is our profit loss statement. So this is just based on the same um, example we had before. Uh, and right at the top here, we've got our, our 248,000 gross surplus. So this was from our trading account. We had sales, less materials, less direct costs to give us that, that $248,000 gross surplus. Um, now, we have a look at this, we can see down the bottom here, we've actually got an overall net loss of $113,000. Um, and that's because our gross profit from the sale of our goods and services of 248 is not enough to cover all our overheads. So we've got some quite chunky overheads here, $57,000 of depreciation. We've got power of 20, uh, interest on the loans, uh, vehicle costs, rent on the property, a whole lot of other costs in there. Uh, and by the time we take those off, in, in that case, we're actually running a loss. So let's say we, we did a bit of a review of this company and we went through all the expenses uh, and we did a line by line analysis of each item and fit, figured out you know, what could we chop, what could we change, what could we get rid of, what do we not need. Um, and you know, maybe we can, you know, through our insurances, we decide we can you know, uh, take a bit more risk ourselves on some things so we can cut some insurance out. Uh, and we go back to the landlord and go, hey, look, we just, we're just we not making money here. Uh, we can't stay in business. Um, we're going to have to either exit or get out. Um, can you do us a bit of a deal on the rent? So um, in this case, maybe we get a couple of cost savings there, and that difference then flows through. Um, also in here, this was, sorry, the, the previous 248 was before making the changes to the uh, gross surplus on that previous slide. So I've confused things a wee bit there. And then the, this new one is now based around um, having made those changes to the gross profit. So that, they, they have the biggest effect. They're adding 140,000 to our bottom line. Um, we have chopped our insurance by 500 bucks, chopped our rent by a couple of hundred dollars. Um, and we're, we're paying our accountant a lot more, of course, because our accountant is, is helping us with these changes. Um, and overall, our bottom line has now gone to a, um, and the surplus of 24,000, and we've got an increase of 138,000 on the previous one. All right. Okay. Oh, accounting fees. Yes, we talked about accounting fees. All right. So hopefully you've got the gist of a balance sheet. It shows the profitability, or in this case, the loss of the business over a period of time. Um, profit is good because that means you're making headway, you're getting ahead. A loss, of course, is bad, and you know, the losses can be sustained for a short period of time. Um, but ultimately, you've got to be making profits, or else you eventually run out of run out of um, you know, equity and cash, and the business grinds to a halt. So that leads us nice, nicely on now to a balance sheet. 
So um, balance sheet is, uh, is a different time frame, as opposed to a profit and loss that was over a period of time, our balance sheet is, is at a set time. So it's at a particular snapshot. So the end of the month, the end of the financial year, the end of the quarter or whatever it is that we're, we're reporting against. Um, it measures the um, net worth or uh, you know, the, the, the net value of the business. There's lots of, um, you know, again, to valuing business, it's quite a different thing to looking at the balance sheet, but it's effectively the, the total assets that the business holds, less the, uh, the, the, the debts or the liabilities that it has to pay, and then that gives you the net worth of what the business is. Um, it's also quite handy for calculating uh, various ratios, and we're going to do a couple of ratios uh, further on through our presentation. Um, so you will have a look at those later on, such as our, our debtor days and our inventory turnover. So here's our, our balance sheet for Food Co. Uh, and as you can see, down the bottom here, um, I don't know if you can see my mouse, now you can't see my mouse, but anyway. <laughs> Sorry? Oh, over there, oh, now you can see my mouse. Um, the, the, the net assets at the moment are 548,000 and our net liabilities are 853, which means the company is actually insolvent. Um, so um, that's yeah, not, a good, not a good way to be. Um, the, just going, um, breaking that down a wee bit further, uh, the top half of here is our total current assets. Uh, so these are liquid stuff, you know, liquid, we're talking about liquid assets, um, cash in the bank, stock on hand, money that's owed to the business. So this is our, our current assets or things that can be easily turned into cash within, say, 30 days' time. Um, on the balance sheet side of things, we've got our current liabilities. So these are typically our bills, um, accounts to pay, things that normally need to be paid reasonably shortly. So in this case, we've got $162,000 of net liabilities, uh, current liabilities, and only 138 of current assets. So as of as the company sits, it couldn't actually pay its bills um, as they are actually due at the moment. So it's, it's in a bit of trouble. Um, and we talked about the net assets. So we'll go back one. No. The, the total um, after bringing in the, the longer term liabilities, there's our bank loans and so on, and our plant property equipment and things. So the plant property are things that um, you know take a bit longer to sell. Um, and if we offset the bank loans, then the, the company's insolvent by 300,000, which is which is not good. Um, as, a, as a director of a company, you have a, a personal responsibility to uh, you know, ensure that companies don't trade while they're insolvent. Um, and sometimes things happen where it just becomes insolvent, and in which case the directors need, um, you know, special, uh, you know, need to really think about why they should carry on trading. And if the company's insolvent and the director carries on trading, then that's that's deemed to be sort of reckless behaviour, uh, and the directors actually then assume personal liability. So, if you're using a company to limit your liability, you've got to be very careful that you don't trade while insolvent, because all of a sudden you now become personally liable for any further debts of the company. All right. Okay. Um, some other things we can get out of our balance sheet. So, um, data days. Uh, so, data days is a is an indication of how long it's taking us to collect our um, sales. So, um, this is sales where we sell by invoice. We send an invoice out to the customer, and normally we give you know terms of trade of seven days or twenty days or whatever your terms of trade are. So this is just an, an averaging sort of um, calculation, of course, um, and it's just a way of comparing periods. So you can complete this calculation at different points in time and see whether things are improving or or getting worse. So in this case here, data days. Uh, we take our total debtors, in this case, the 72,167, and we divide that by our total sales, the one, $1 million, uh, and that gives us a really low fraction, of course, and then we multiply that out by 365 days in the year, and that gives us an indication figure of 26. So um, 
what that is saying is that on average, we are collecting our sales after 26 days. Okay, now, if we were to change our terms and trade um, and stop giving people 30 days to pay and give a whole lot of customers only seven days to pay, uh, negotiate you know, new terms of trade, some of our, our big customers and tell them oh, we need to, need to get paid quicker, um, then um, improvement of five days. So if we improved our debtors' days by five days, so we, we brought our debtors down or our accounts receivable figure, the 72,000, if that came down, um, then this is the new, you know, the new calculation uh, would be uh, uh, the $1 million divided by 365 times 5,000, uh, five gives us the $13,000 savings. So um, yeah, it's a wee bit, wee bit of roundabouts in a way formula, but if our if our account receivable will drop by 13,000, our debt of days will drop down to 21 days, and that would show an indication that we have improved in our debt collection. Uh, inventory days is, is sort of a similar, so take total inventory divided by the cost of sales times 365, and that gives us a, a effectively an inventory turnover, so um, how often we are turning that inventory over within that period. And again, we can calculate an improvement. So if we want to improve that by nine days, um, we go cost of sales divided by 365 times the number of days we want to improve. And that would, would mean we actually have an extra $7,800 cash, uh, less cash tied up in the inventory. So you know, if we could improve our data collection by five days and reduce our, uh, increase our stock turn by nine days, you add those two to figure, it figures together to give us an extra twenty thousand dollars cash. Um, it's not going to solve our immediate problem, but it does bring our current assets and current liabilities closer together. If we added twenty two thousand to here, that would become one hundred and sixty, and it means we've almost got enough cash to pay our bills as they fall due. All right. Hopefully, I'm totally confused you with that one, but we'll move on. This one's stack change in equity. Um, so this is really the, the connecting uh, report that connects our profit loss with our balance sheet. So it, it, it connects the two together. So our balance sheet is a uh, position at a point in time. And if you go um, the position between uh, two different points in time, say between the you know, um, 31st of March, 2020, through to the 30th of September, 2020, that's six months, so the difference between those two points in time will equate to our profit loss covering that same period of time. Okay. Um, and again, it shows the uh, at net position of the company, so the assets less liabilities. So here's a, a, an example here. Um, and we can see that this company actually has an opening negative retained earnings. So it's been in losses for, for a wee while. Again, not good. Um, and you can see in 2019, it started off with um, you know, a loss carried forward of 139. It made a, another loss of 52,000, so it ended up with a loss carried forward of 100, 191, which means at that point, our liabilities exceeded our assets by 191,000. That becomes our opening balance for 220. We've got a loss of 113, so we've now got an you know, even bigger problem. We've now got um, liabilities exceeding the assets by 300,000. Um, your retained earnings uh, movement equity is also quite handy because if you want to pay dividends as a director, you can only declare a dividend if this is positive. You can't pay a dividend when it's in negatives. Um, and if you do, that dividend can be reversed by a liquidator. So handy to not do that. All right, shareholder current accounts. Um, so you just got to think when, when you're working with a company, a company is a completely separate legal entity. It's like another person, you know, it's like uh, a friend of yours or someone else that you're dealing with, right? Um, it's not you, it's not your money, although you might own the company, it is a separate entity onto its own. And when you put money into that company, uh, it's all, all either share capital going in or it's money that you are lending to that company. So like a, and that, that gets recorded in your shareholders' current account as money that you've put into the company. And the same when you take money out of the company, it comes out as drawings out of that current account. So you, you, your shareholders' current account shows you the net proceeds of the money you have put in, less the money you have taken out of the company. 
All right. Um, now, there are other things that can go through there too. So as, as accountants, quite often we might prepare the end of the year set of accounts and we decide that there's a good profit in there and we might just do a book entry salary to allocate that profit to the shareholder. So not, not a cash transaction, um, but we allocate some of the profit and we transfer that as a, as a wage cost to the company effectively or a shareholder salary and we record that as an advance into the shareholder's current account and the shareholder can draw it out sometime at a later date. All right, anything else I need to say about that one? Um, you do need to watch them when they're overdrawn. Um, an overdrawn current account is uh, uh, when you've taken out more than you've put in. Um, and an overdrawn current account is considered to be, um, falls under the FBT regime, that's fringe benefit, you've borrowed money from a company, and the company then has to charge you interest on that money. Um, that interest that comes taxable income to the company, which has to pay tax on, and you don't get a deduction in your tax return for the loss. So we try to avoid overdrawn current accounts. The second thing with the overdrawn current account is if everything does turn to custard and the company gets uh, liquidated, the liquidator will come in and often the first thing they will look at is the current account. And if the current account shows that the shareholder has taken too much money out, they will just make a demand on that shareholder saying, Pay that money back, uh, and that's often the first place they'll look at, and they'll chase that shareholder, um, whether it's through the courts or the bankruptcy or whatever, to try and get that money back into the company so the liquidator can then allocate it out to the other people in the company who have owed money. Right, so we've got an example here of a current account, um, and we can see here we've got our opening balance of uh, you know 32,000 in the 219 year. Um, they put in some funds, 5,792. They took out some money, some drawings, and the company's also paying the life insurance for the shareholder. And that then leaves a closing balance of 29,474. And that becomes the opening balance in the, in the 220 year. And again, we've got the same, we've got some money going in, 2078, some drawings and life insurance. And at the end of uh, 2020, the shareholder is now only owed $21,000. All right, fixed assets. Um, so, fixed asset register. Uh, when we buy a, a major asset, um, you know, not just some you know small amounts. You know, we don't really consider you know things like paper and pencils and stuff. They they're, they're not assets. They're just expenses. Um, but yeah, you buy a vehicle or a piece of equipment or a plant piece of uh, plant equipment, something that's going to you know last for a period of time. Then we, we can't really just expense that right away. And really that asset is gonna last for quite a while. So as accountants, what we try to do is, is allocate a bit of the cost of that asset to each period or to each year, um, rather than claim it all right away. Um, the IID have allowed us, the, or the government has changed the rules for this year. So this year we can expense items up to $5,000 immediately. Uh, and it's like that through to about March next year. Uh, so it's a good time to buy some bits of equipment and get an immediate deduction for it. Uh, but normally that, that's a, a smaller amount. So basically we are just taking that asset and we're spreading the cost over what we ex the expected life of that asset. So if you buy a machine and the machine makes widgets, and it's going to last for five years, then we would expense one fifth of that machine every year until it's not worth anything at the end. So depreciation is that, that recording of that expense in our PL. That's a non cash item, but it helps us match the cost of using that asset against the, 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 the production of, from that asset. All right, so we have um, fixed asset register here. And we, on the left, first column, we've got all our, um, the list of all our assets broken into different categories. And we have um, the cost or the, the, what we paid for those items initially. Um, now the cost is recorded uh, excluding GST. And the reason for that is because, you know, say we might've paid uh, $25,000 for the van, but when we filed our GST return, the, the ID gave us back that GST. So the actual cost of the business is the exclusive amount. Um, next column here is our opening value, all right? So every year we depreciate the value and therefore the, the value for the next year is the, the cost less that depreciation. So that now has a, a, a lower value at the beginning of each year. 
purchases and disposals. This shows us changes to our asset ledgers. Um, so here we've, we've, we've um, uh, added a website on. So you can see there's nothing there last year and we've paid eight and a half thousand for a website. So that's a purchase. Um, and we've um, um, sold or written off some, some uh, software, computer and iPad um, they had a value of a dollar, nine dollars, and seven dollars, and we've effectively disposed of those. So they're at the end of their useful life, and they're no longer used. So we can we dispose of them and wipe them off. The rate is the uh, the the how we are going to apply that across the period. So it's a percentage, um, and our method is the how we're going to apply. It. So these ones are all at diminishing value, which means that the the depreciation is calculated. Um, at based on the opening value times the rate. Okay, so in this case, 7,800 for the van, the rate's 30%, so one third, 30% of that is, is 2,100 and something is gonna be our depreciation for the year. The other method that's um, used, um, maybe not so common, but a straight line, and that's where you allocate the cost evenly over the number of years. Um, so the idea lets us use both different methods and they have tables that we look up to find those rates for each, each method. Um, so our depreciation is our calculation between the uh, value times the rate because it's our depreciation and our closing accumulated depreciation is our uh, effectively all the depreciation that has been calculated since the purchase of those assets. So it's just an accumulation of that depreciation figure each year is then accumulated. And then our far right hand column there is our closing value. So that's the opening value, uh, less the, um, this year's depreciation gives our closing value, or it could be the opening cost, less the accumulated depreciation gives the closing value value. They both give us the, give us the same calculation either way. All right, all good, clear as mud. Hope you got some questions about that at the end, maybe. Uh, cash, difference between cash and profit. Uh, turnover is vanity, so turnover is all for show. Uh, profit is what's really important, sanity, uh, but cash flow is what's real. It's the money in the bank, the cash that's coming in, going through the till, uh, FPOS sales, customers paying their bills, customer money going out is the, the really important factor. So we have different reports. Um, for um, cash reports. So you can have a cash report that shows you all your cash receipts and cash payments, and cash in the bank. Uh, and you need to look at that in conjunction with your profit loss because between the two, you get a picture of your cash flow and you get a picture of your profitability. So sometimes cash flow can be negative because you're buying lots of assets, uh, but your profitability is, is good, so that's fine. Uh, and sometimes profit might be negative, uh, which is bad because you're losing money, but your cash flow looks good because you've got, um, you know, people who have been paying debts from the past have started paying up, or you've been putting some money into the business. So you need to look at the two together to understand the full picture. Right, so we're just going to run through some items here, sort of spread them out between uh, profit or cash. Uh, the first one here is GST, uh, and GST is uh, fix our cash. Um, that's part of our, uh, something we've got to pay. But for profitability, when we run our, our p and reports, we exclude GST. So the reason behind that is on all of our sales, we collect the GST, but we have to give that bit of GST back to the government. So actual sales is net. And on all our expenses, we, we pay the GST, but the government gives it back to us. So that cost of the expenses is the net amount. So GST doesn't affect our profit, but it affects our cash. Next one, loan payments. Uh, loan payments are, again, cash. They don't hit the P&L. Um, the way to think about that is a, a loan is just a transfer of an asset. So you had some money in the bank and you use it to pay the loan, which now means you have a reduced debt. So um, your position hasn't really changed. Next up, we've got interest on the loans. So interest on the loans goes in both. Okay, it affects our p &L. it's an expense of the business, we pay the money to the bank, they're not gonna give it back to us, so it's gone, uh, and it's a cash expense, so it comes out of you know, cash flow. Um, next one is asset purchases. Um, asset purchases don't hit our p &L because again, a bit like the loan repayments, we have exchanged cash and we now have an asset. So we had $5,000 cash, we went and bought a car, we now have a $5,000 car. 
We haven't lost anything, we haven't gained anything, we have just moved the asset around. So yes, it affects our cash, um, and it doesn't affect our profit. Asset sales, um, just the same as our, our asset purchases, we've got less assets and more cash, we hope. Um, and depreciation is our last one on here. Uh, and depreciation, as I explained, is it's not a cash item, but it sits in our p &L. Okay, so it's the allocation of the asset purchase over the period of that asset. So that sits in our p and All right. Business cycle. Um, so, start off in business, and someone has to put some money into the business to get it going. So the owners normally invest in the business. The idea is they, uh, the business then um, you know, buys some assets of, of one form or another, and it might use some finance to um, actually buy more assets than what the owners put in. The idea of being in business is to try and make a profit, so you're going to use those assets to, to generate a profit. Um, and the profits might get put back into the business, um, which can then be used to further grow the business. Um, or money can come out of the business, it might come out of shareholder salaries or dividends or um, so on like that. Profitability should eventually drive cash. So if your business is profitable, it should be generating some cash. Uh, there can be a lag or a lead between the cash and the profitability. But basically, if you're profitable, it should eventually make, be making some cash. Uh, and then th that cash can either be um, taken out of the business um, or it could be tied up in things like slow paying debtors. You could have made the sale, therefore the profit's been recorded, but you haven't actually got the cash in the door because the customer hasn't paid you. Uh, you could be tied up a lot more stock. Um, the cash can also be used to repay business loans. I've explained that it doesn't actually uh, reduce our profit, it's just taking cash and reducing a liability. Um, you've got to pay your tax, of course, um, and, um, and, or you're paying the suppliers faster. Um, cash gains, um, if you collect your money faster, uh, decrease the amount of stock, um, chase up your, uh, or make payments slower to your suppliers and reduce the tax payable bit you some gains. That then goes, you know, the, the profits lead to cash. The cash can go to the owners. The owners might take that out of the business or they might reinvest that in the business um, to continue uh, the, the business cycle. Um, yeah, pretty good. All right, value. We were uh, looking at the value of a business. Um, the thing is that what the way a business is valued is, is um, different for every single industry, every single business, uh, and it's quite a specialised field. Um, so I don't, I don't do you know, business valuations as such, but I understand the principles that go in behind um, the, how you know businesses are valued. Um, so uh, essentially it comes down to that a business that can make money for someone has a value. You know, if it's not making any profits, it has very little value unless the, the potential buyer can look at it and go, I can turn this around or I can turn it to something else. Um, but it's, it's really like if you, um, you know, go and invest some money, I say in the bank, the banks that pay you nothing out of so it's a good, bad, bad example, but you invest some money in the share market and you hope to get a 5% return on that money. So, um, you know, if you put in $100,000, if you get, say, a $5,000 return at a five, and you're expecting a 5% return, then that $5,000 would be worth $100,000. All right, so invest $100,000 in the market, get a 5% return, gives you $5,000 return on your money. So the value of a company is sort of the same way. Um, if the company is going to generate $5,000 in profit and the person who's going to buy the company wants to get a 5% return, they would say it's worth about $100,000 okay, in, in broad terms. But there's a whole lot of other factors that do come into it. And like I say, it is quite a specialised field. But ultimately, if you want to grow the value of your business, what you're looking to do is to increase that revenue, increase the um, profitability. The more profitable a business is, the more it's going to be worth. Okay, so you want to have a clear plan on um, you know, how you're going to do that, how you're going to grow your sales, grow your business. Um, documentation is quite, uh, I know it's painful to do, but if you want to sell a business, 
the person buying it wants to know what, the, what it is that they're going to get for their money. And if you have good systems and processes that are well documented, that they can pick up and run with the established staff, there's more value than that than just having having a, you know, a standard sort of business that, that's all, it's all in the owner's head and, and no one else understands how to work it. And that's where you know, franchises sort of create their value from, that you can go and buy a franchise, which is basically a whole heap of processes and systems, and based on other operators who have bought that franchise and follow those systems, they make money. Yeah, things like Domino's Pizzas and these sorts of guys, you know, it's just a process of a bunch of systems that the franchise owners are buying and they do the training and they follow the process and systems and if they do it right, they end up making some money, reduces the risk and therefore increases the value of the business. All right. Protecting your assets. Um, so, you know, being a business is risky. Um, and we've just seen it this year too with the whole COVID-19 coming along. You just not, you don't know what's going to come around the corner, what could be happening next. Um, you know, going to work every day for a, for a nine to five job is, is, you know, reasonably low risk. You know, you turn up to work, you do your work, you get paid to go home. Um, there's always the chance, I suppose, you lose your job, but there's, there's not so many risks like running a business. There are so many things that can go wrong in a business, um, so many things that can catch you off guard. And you know, sometimes the best run businesses still find themselves in trouble through no fault of their own. Something goes wrong and it takes them down. Um, and I think if you look around the, you know, the construction industry, there's a whole heap of failures in the last couple of years. Um, you know, and these are reasonably sized big businesses. And um, you know, it's like they, they do their best, but they still get taken down by unforeseen events as well. So what can you do to protect your assets? Um, uh, again, it's quite a specialized field, but we'll go through some, some um, headline sort of points there. So um, I say to everyone nowadays, you should be using a company. They're really cheap to set up um, and providing you run them correctly. They do provide a, a limitation of liability. Something goes wrong in the company. It's the company that is held, um, the assets, the company that are at risk, not your personal stuff. Providing, of course, you haven't drawn it all out and made the company current account overdrawn and traded while and sold and all those things. But, you know, there is that limitation of liability. Directorships. So the directors take the can, they carry the liability if they're trading while insolvent. Um, and I see you know, quite a lot of husband and wife companies where they're both directors. And you sort of go, well, why are you both in the can? You know, why are you both taking that risk? Uh, really, you know, there's not much point in both, both taking that risk when you can, you know, effectively just one of you could be the director. Um, and there's a really good case down um, Bluff with a fishing boat um, in the name of both you know, the company, both you know, husband and wife. Um, unfortunately, the boat sunk, um, people died, um, the husband was on the boat, so he lost his life, uh, and the remaining uh, wife, who was the director of the company, then got um, you know, uh, held up for health and safety, and she wore the can for, for, you know, for the health and safety risk of the, the boat not operating correctly. So, in which case, you know, did she really need to be a director? Anyway, um, if you provide loans to other entities or loans to other, other businesses, get them documented properly um, so that if you need to call them up, there is a way of calling them up and um, if, if try and get some security so that if you're lending money, it's over an asset so that if you can't get the um, money back, you can try and recover the asset from the other entity. Um, talking about high value assets, uh, so definitely property. Um, and you see this set up quite often where, you know, if you're operating out of your own, own building, um, have the building owned in one company and have the trading enterprise from another company or the, the building and the equipment uh, have one and the trading engine another one that rents the building off it. Um, that way, if the trading company goes under, you hope you still have, have uh, the building company operating that uh, you know, survives to, to uh, raise the, the Phoenix can raise from the ashes another day. Um, uh, in terms of trade, uh, so often I run into small business clients who don't have terms of trade and it's just part of protecting your business. Make sure you've got terms of trade with your customers, that they have signed an agreement that they will pay you within a set period of time, um, that if there are costs of collection that they will wear those costs um, and that, that just encourages them to pay because if you point out to them that, hey, if I've got to get my legal, my legal team onto you, it's going to cost you another $1,000, um, then obviously that's an incentive for them to pay. 
uh, insurances. So insurances there to protect the unforeseen. Um, you want enough insurance to, to cover those unexpected items, but not so much that it drowns the business either. It's always a tricky balance, um, but yeah. Um, financial planning. So really referring here to your own assets, um, having a plan in place for your own investments and your own assets, um, and talking to either uh, maybe a lawyer about how you protect your, your personal assets uh, and a financial plan as to how you want to invest for your retirement with your own assets. Estate planning is, uh, of course, once you fall off the planet, someone else has got to deal with the, uh, the aftermath. Um, so you should have a will, um, should have powers of attorney in place, and a clear plan for what you expect to happen if you, you know, do disappear. Do you want everything sold up and distributed to the kids or given to the SPCA or whatever the story is? Um, don't leave you even a scratch in the head as to what you wanted to happen. All right. Best practice. Um, best practice, have a business plan. Um, once you've devised your first business plan, updating it once a year is quite easy, but again, that first one is, is a bit of work, I suppose. Um, have a clear plan of what you're trying to achieve. As part of that annual business plan, do a, an annual forecast uh, as to where you see the financial side of the business tracking for the year ahead, um, and then report against that forecast. And it could be monthly, it could be quarterly, it could be six monthly, but you know, just see how things are tracking against that. That gives you a heads up as to how things are going, and if things aren't going so well, what can you do to either revigorate it, or do you need to find ways to cop costs, or do you need to cop cut costs <laughs> or, um, or or do you need to mothball certain things and focus on the profitable areas of business or focus on the business that are going well. So knowing your numbers is just the start of that uh, and, and um, uh, just an important part of that business. And I think we're just about done now. We, um, yeah, um, so I mean, I, I'm in practice, a small accounting firm here, and you know, our aim is really to help our clients uh, to figure out what their goals are, help them uh, implement some uh, good best practices to achieve those goals. Uh, we can provide the uh, um, admin support and the financial reporting side of things, and we like to sit down with our clients on a regular basis and, and see how things are tracking. Um, so we're not just here to do tax returns, um, we're actually here to be part of your team, part of your business. Um, and you know, if you'd like to have a chat to us, then we're we're more than uh, open to uh, finding what we can do to help you with your business and where that where that all fits together. We run uh, fixed price uh, pricing. Uh, that said, I have to be aware of variable, uh, sort of see what's involved, have a chat about uh, how much work it is and things. Um, but yeah, we like to honour our fixed prices, and we can spread a um, price for a service over over the year. So um, you might have a business plan uh, and a forecast as part of that, just for, two grand for those two items, and then you might want to meet three times a year to uh, to review those things. So that comes up at 2,900, and we would split that across equally over the 12 months. So you don't have to find 2,900 or one fee, um, you're gonna be finding 250 bucks a month or something, which is you know, far more manageable. Um, we can do the work and you can pay us each month over the rest of the year, um, and you know, happy to be engaged in part of that. So I think that brings us to question time. Uh, Shana, have we had any questions? Uh, fantastic. Yeah, so we've got a couple of questions here. Um, and if anyone else has any, any questions or they're not um, quite sure of anything, just buy through a question now and we can answer it. Um, so the first question is, what is the difference between the annual accounts and accounts that can be produced throughout the year? Yeah, so um, accounting is always, well not always, but Forecasts look to the future, and accounting tends to look at the past or historical. Um, an annual set of accounts, uh, you know, there's a requirement for companies to prepare an annual set of financial statements. Directors are required to do that uh, as part of the Companies Act, um, and there's also a requirement to file a tax return with the IRD, which is typically driven out of those annual financial statements. So the annual financial statements cover the whole year, uh, and they may not be prepared until a bit of time after the end of the year, so they can be quite historic. Um, not a lot of use as far as, as going forward. They do give you an idea of how the year went. Um, Whereas uh, regular accounts, you might do monthly accounts or quarterly accounts, we can normally get those put together within a few weeks after them or a few days 
after the end of the period and you might do a monthly report and that gives you an idea of how things went last month and, and it gives you far more um, timely information in order which to make based, or based decisions on. Cool, yeah. awesome. Um, another question here, what, uh, what is the difference between markup and margin? You talked about gross margin, is that the same as the markup I put on my prices? Um, yeah, <laughs> uh, they are quite different things, um, but very similar. Um, and it just depends on where, where you're moving from which one to which one. Um, and they are the same. Um, that just confused the hell out of everyone. I think it probably did. But <laughs> markup is if you are looking at the cost price of the product that you're selling and you're adding, say it costs you 75% and you're going to add a 33% markup on it. So $75 times 33 is $25. And therefore, you add that on to your cost price. So you're marking it up by 33%, gives you a sale price of $75, of $100. So you're marking up by one third. Now, if you're selling that product for $100 and your cost price is 75, which is the same in the example before, then your profit is $25. So we talk about gross profit as dividing the profit by the sales. So $25 divided by 100 is 25%. So our markup is going from cost price upwards, 33, and our gross profit is sales coming backwards is 25% based on sales. And there's a really complicated form if you want to convert one to the other, which Ernst will tell you how to do. Fantastic. <laughs> so I don't think we have any other questions there. So thank you very much. And um, I think that brings us to the end of our webinar today. Okay, um, yeah, thank you. Thanks to all those attendees who made the time to come and listen in or those who uh, download the, uh, the link that we send out. Hope you've enjoyed it um, and you've got something out of it. As I said, give us a call if you have any questions. Always happy to help out um, our fellow other small business people.